Hello, everyone. So welcome to Accessibility in New York City. I'm Thomas Logan. I'm one of the uh, organizers of the event, and we appreciate everyone coming out today for our first event of 2019. Yay! Yes, it's 2019! Yes, yeah, right, going to be more enthusiastic. It's a new year, new beginnings, you know. Um, and we're here at ThoughtBot, and so uh, Stephanie here in the back is office manager here. Thank you, as always, to ThoughtBot as our event space host. Uh, really appreciate having this space and being able to have the events here. We're typically the first Tuesday of uh, every month. This month we're actually having a second meetup on the 22nd. So we're going to have a second one in January because it's 2019 and, and and the speakers here from London. So making a, a special uh, accommodation there. And we will be streaming that event as well. Um, here at the stream, we'd like to thank uh, Jolly McPhee from the Internet Society of New York uh, for putting together our stream. So for people that can't attend in person or to follow up on past presentations, we stream and also archive all of the presentations that we have here. Also, a shout out to Mir by Night from White Coat Captioning. She is providing uh, the live captioning that we have tonight. Um, and tonight we have this uh, displayed at the top of our screen, um, but on our live stream, got that down at the bottom. So we've got live captioning at all of our events. And we, uh, as part of Accessibility New York City, you know, we commit to having uh, the, the captioning available for every event that we do. And we'd like to thank Level Access, who's our sponsor for helping uh, provide and enable us to have captioning at the events. With that all being said, it's now time to hand it over uh, to our presenter, Eric Bailey. I met Eric in Toronto last year. Great accessibility speaker and also works for ThoughtBot and was like amazing to uh, be able to have someone from the place that we've been hosting our events uh, present for us uh, tonight and uh, to learn about this very important issue. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Wow, um, I'm blushing. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I'm Eric. I'm a designer at ThoughtBot. Um, I guess not only am I a member, I'm also a client. Uh, I'm very excited and happy to be here today. Uh, and I'll be delivering my talk. If it's interactive, it needs a focus style. Uh, and I figure um, we can save questions for the end, unless there's something pressing. Um, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And without further ado, let's just hop right into it. So uh, this is the Mona Lisa by Italian Renaissance painter Leonardo da Vinci. It's a priceless work of art, easily one of the most famous paintings ever created. So two questions I want to ask you. Is it beautiful? And is it useful? Beautiful, yes. Uh, da Vinci was a master of his medium. Uh, the subject's enigmatic expression has inspired generations of tribute, imitation, parody, and analysis. Uh, useful from a societal perspective, undoubtedly. Um, however, it's just a wood panel with some paint applied to it. Fragile, brittle, and needs co a controlled environment and constant conservation efforts. What can we do with this? Not a whole lot. This is a leg splint made by the husband and wife design team Charles and Ray Eames. They were commissioned by the US Navy during World War II to design a lightweight splint to get wounded soldiers out of the field without causing any additional injuries. Uh, the metal splints of that period weren't secure enough to hold a leg still, causing unnecessary traumatic injury and death from things like gangrene, shock, and blood loss. Is it beautiful? I think so. The molding followed the contours of the human leg, giving the splint a flowing organic shape. Uh, this molding technique was later used by the Eames to make both sculpture and furniture, including the Eames chair. You might have heard of it, it's a highly coveted piece of designer furniture. But is it useful? Definitely. It's literally saved lives. This is a hammer you can find at any hardware store. <laughs> is it useful? Uh, very much so. Is it beautiful? When viewed through the right lens, definitely. Uh, the hammer's bell and neck are elegantly tapered to minimize weight and maximize driving force. And the claw's V-shape makes it so it can pry out nails of many different sizes without any special attachments. And the handle is sculpted in, in a way that is both comfortable to grip and slip resistant. This is a CSS declaration of outline none applied to everything on a website. Way back when, many print designers transitioned to web design and brought their biases with them, uh, codifying and perpetuating a lot of bad ideas. 
This included writing CSS resets that globally removed all outlines because there was the perception that they were ugly when compared with the static layout that you get with printed content. While the web does borrow a lot from print, it isn't print, and we should stop thinking about it that way. Uh, many people rely on not having uh, outlines removed for reasons we'll get to in a bit. And for the record, I'd like to point out that many CSS reset authors later recanted this decision to remove outlines from the resets after learning how important they were for the people who relied on them. Focus styles are commonly thought of as ugly, but I think that's because we approach it with the wrong mindset. They're an integral part of the web, and we should treat them like such. A good link includes a good focus style to help the people who rely on them navigate. So what makes a good link? On this, slide, link the is, is, uh, on this slide is Link the protagonist from the Legend of Zelda game series. First, we write the word link. That clues us into what we're trying to do. We don't say click here because not everyone clicks with things like mice. But the word link is pretty ambiguous when placed in the context of two or more. So what we want to do is use a word or phrase that describes where activating the link will take you. In the context of a page, you begin to tell the story of where you can go and what you can expect to find when you get there. The text that, the text that describes a link is what we call an affordance. Affordances are hints about how something should be used. Think of them as little cheat sheets for operating things. Uh, the image on this slide is a push handle for a door. Another common affordance we use for links is assigning them a color to distinguish them from the surrounding text. Blue is a commonly understood link color because of the color used in many browsers' fallback style sheets. Uh, this external consistency is a quick win for cognitive considerations as it's one less hurdle to overcome when first learning the ins and outs of a website's interface. But if you don't see color the same way other people do, this may prevent you from determining if text is a link or not. To get around this, we add an underline to help distinguish what a link is. This affordance is as old as the internet itself. Underlines equals links. For using a mouse or a trackpad, we want feedback to tell us that we've successfully identified the link we want to activate. This communicates to the user that the cursor has been successfully placed on an area that can be interacted with. Removing the underline on a link when a cursor is hovering over it is a good way to indicate that. It doesn't rely on just color alone to communicate state change. We also want to have a state that confirms that we've successfully activated the link in question. This reassures the person clicking the link that something is actually going to happen. Uh, this is ideal for low power devices, low bandwidth and or high server load scenarios where it might take some time for the site or device to deliver on your request. But how do we identify a link if we aren't using a cursor or a trackpad? We use a focus style, which is a visual indicator that works much like the hover style. Here we have successfully identified the link we want to activate via the tab key on the keyboard. Uh, the fallback style sheet that ships with every browser includes code for focus styles that appear if none is provided by the author. This is important to note. The deliberate inclusion of focus styles is a recognition by browser manufacturers that people interact with web content in multiple ways. However, not all fallback browser focus styles are good enough to meet acceptable web content accessibility guidelines criteria for contrast. Firefox, in particular, uses a tiny dotted outline. Uh, this might prevent low vision users from being able to perceive which link has been focused on, which isn't great. Uh, if they can't see if something has been identified, it will be tough or impossible to know that they can activate it. What we can do is use CSS to overwrite the browser's default focus style and create one that is web content accessibility guidelines compliant. Here, I've turned the dotted outline into a solid blue outline using a color that matches the hyperlink color to further visually reinforce the fact that it is a link. We could also fill the background of the link in with the blue color and update the text to be white. Now it's even more visually apparent. That's great for both biological and environmental low vision conditions. So you want to make sure that each of your states is visually distinct and separate from the other states when styling an interactive element. Because each state is discrete, it allows us to more easily understand what's happening to it. Here I have a link um, with hover, focus, active, and visited CSS selectors. And uh, note with the visited link state, it may or may not be um, desirable depending on your use case. It's best to use these kinds of things for uh, collections of links that are used for task completion, such as viewing training materials or navigating through a table of contents. 
Another thing worth mentioning um, is the options for styling a visited link are a little bit limited due to privacy and security concerns, so make sure you do your research before you start to create these kinds of styling. In a pinch, you can usually use your hover state for your focus state. Combine the two selectors with a comma to save on effort and file size. If there's one practical thing you take away from this talk, it's that this little hack can go a long way to helping your users out. Links aren't the only interactive element out there either. Here's a button element, uh, another workhorse of a modern user interface. Like links, buttons have discrete states that you can style. Uh, there's hover, focus, active, and disabled. You'll note that the button has a disabled state and not a visited one. Uh, this is because a button is a trigger for an action and not a destination. Disabling links is technically possible, but can wreak havoc on assistive technology. It's best not to do it. I'm using the disabled HTML attribute as a CSS selector, um, meaning that appearance here is semantically tied to state. So now we know why it's important to have all states represented for our links and buttons and how to implement them. On this slide is a knife switch in an open position. But interactive elements on the web aren't just limited to links and buttons. And this system of distinct and discrete visual treatments for state should be applied to anything a person can interact with. The other inter interactive elements uh, the HTML standard gives us are uh, buttons, details, sometimes the object element depending on its implementation, and input, select, and text area with an accompanying label. Uh, these elements all constitute the basic building blocks of any modern robust design system. You should also make sure that your focus styles work for links that wrap non-text content, including things like images. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just make sure that it's obvious. And of course, don't forget to provide alternate descriptions for those who may be unable to view your content. Here we have a puppy in a flower pot. It's a myth that styling focus states is limited to just the outline property as well. Uh, you have the full range of CSS to work with. Just make sure that when a state is styled, it is done so in such a way that it does not shift the page's layout around when activated. This is disorienting and can make a person lose their place. Um, I like to use properties that won't cause the browser to recalculate box sizes, such as uh, color, background, and box shadow. Speaking of box shadows, one technique I especially like using is using uh, stock, stacked box shadows to create a ring around an element that will honor its border radius. You can see here, I have two uh, declarations of a box shadow, uh, one with the color of the background and one with the color of the focus as variables. And you'll notice here that I'm removing the outline to get this effect. Uh, this is a situation where it's actually acceptable to remove the outline, so long as the focus style you replace it with is distinct and passes uh, web content accessibility guidelines color contrast criteria. It's a mouthful. Um, however, people experiencing low vision conditions may use Windows high contrast mode to help them read. So it's good to check our styled states to make sure they hold up. Um, high contrast mode will strip away a lot of CSS, including box shadow. To get around this, uh, what we can do is use a high contrast mode media query to tweak the focus style to fill the button in instead. Here, uh, with the MS high contrast active uh, media statement. We are styling the background color with the color keyword button face and the color with the, um, with the value window. Um, this will ensure that the, that the uh, color in high contrast mode will match what the user has specified, uh, thus ensuring that contrast is preserved. Um, this could be helpful for people who are magnifying their screen as the focus effect is more pronounced and therefore easier to perceive. Alternate ways to identify and activate content aren't just limited to keyboards. This is a switch which helps some people with motor control issues operate technology. They're typically large hardware buttons that you can program to do different things. And this is neither a mouse or keyboard interaction. It's binary input that may emulate other kinds of input. Focus styles aren't just limited to assistive technology either. Um, here I'm using the Apple TV remote to identify the tile that I want to activate. In my case, that's too much Netflix. And we're not just limited to the focus selector anymore. Um, the W3C has two new CSS properties for us to play with, focus within and focus visible. Uh, this slide's photo is a statue of the Buddha. Focus within is a pseudo class that is activated when an element is focused or contains an element that is focused. 
Currently, the most recent versions of Firefox, Chrome, and Safari support it. Uh, this is a screenshot from Can I Use showing the support table. A practical example of how we could use this could be for a table whose cells contain links. Here's a list of uh, NBC television affiliates, station, channel, city market, and own since breakdown. With focus within, I'm able to highlight an entire table row when a link in one of the table cells has received focus. This is done entirely with CSS, something that you could previously only accomplish with the help of JavaScript. Here's how it works. We're looking at the table represented as a hierarchical tree in the document object model, or DOM for short. Focus within is declared on a parent node to the one that will receive focus events. In our example, that's the table row. When a focus event occurs on the link inside of a table cell, the event travels up the DOM tree until it hits the element that has focus within declared on it. Styling rules are then applied as the conditions required by focus within have been met. Note that if the browser does not support the selector and it is included in a list of other valid selectors, the entire group declaration will be ignored. So be sure to author your CSS with care and discretion. Uh, on this slide is a tweet by Keith J. Grant illustrating this point. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about other people's opinions regarding focus styles and what you can do about them. On this slide is Michael Scott, the boss from The Office, probably the greatest villain in modern literature. Um, sometimes you're trying to be a good ally and have a strong case for incorporating focus states into your site, but a less informed person can override you because they have more organizational clout. So what can we do about it? Focus visible is a pseudo class that is activated when an element is focused and a user agent determines via heuristics the user's input modality. That's a fancy way of saying it shows focus styling when activated via input other than a mouse, cursor, or finger tap. So say you have a link on a website and a person decides it's interesting and wants to visit it. They identify the link. If focus visible is declared on it, the browser runs a bunch of logic to figure out what input the person is using. This allows us to create separate focus styles, one for cursor input and one for keyboard input. This allows us to create two separate modes for your website, one that is shown to mouse or trackpad users and one that is for everybody else. Currently, only Firefox supports it, as shown by this screenshot from the support table um, for the pseudo class from Can I Use? Uh, but we can get other browsers supporting it by using a polyfill, which is a technique that uses JavaScript to recreate a browser feature. But in addition to the extra data to download and maintenance concerns that come with introducing a polyfill, I'd like you to consider this. Can you trust your heuristics? I'm parent, I mean skeptical. Um, computers are awful at understanding the context of the real world. Here's Google's world-class algorithm having trouble telling the difference between dogs and fried chicken. <coughs> you, can, you can search for that, it'll, it'll show up. Yeah, it's great. Um, and the web is more than just mice and keyboards. We're seeing more and more devices with multimodal inputs becoming commonplace, meaning that a person may be switching input on the fly to best accomplish their task. For example, someone using the Microsoft Surface may at any point be using a mouse, a trackpad, touch, keyboard, stylus, gesture, or voice inputs. Form factor is also an unreliable metric, so device sniffing is out. For example, here's a Gemini PDA, which is a clamshell Android sm smartphone with a QWERTY keyboard. I really want one, it looks awesome. <coughs> Devices may also have their input augmented. Uh, the latest screen reader survey by WebAIM revealed that a total of 62.3% of all participants use an external keyboard in conjunction with their mobile device in some capacity. This especially should give us pause for concern about making assumptions about how people actually use their devices. Now let's talk about people. I have a lot of problems with identifying people as assistive technology users without their express consent. I think the general idea behind Focus Visible is well-intentioned, but ultimately, ultimately may be a slippery slope solution. The specific concerns I have aren't new, nor are they exclusive to just me. For, for starters, if you spent any amount of time doing web development, 
you know that trying to make solutions based on detecting what the browser reports is an unsustainable nightmare. There's also the collecting and sharing of personally identifying information. Uh, focus within can be used as a hook to try and identify people as an assistive technology user. From a technical perspective, this runs afoul of the same kind of problems device sniffing does. And regardless of its accuracy, who the hell knows what a person collecting this kind of information is doing with it? Uh, mass data breaches are also commonplace occurrences these days. Would you feel comfortable having this kind of information about you sold to, out there sold to the highest bidder? Another big picture concern is if you don't actually check to see if your design solutions work the way you intended with the people for your with the people you're designing for. There's a whole host of biases, assumptions, and subtle nuance that silently worm their way into the design process, especially when it comes to designing for disability. And we should be always on guard to prevent that. Finally, uh, this line of thinking is starting to creep back into a terrible trend of the early web, which was separate sites for assistive technology users. These sites didn't always have parity in information or capability compared to the sites that they were supposed to accompany and often forced people to contact support if they needed assistance, an embarrassing act that reduces personal autonomy. There's a reason you don't see these kinds of sites that much anymore, and that's because they don't work. You know, in fact, Scandinavian Airlines was recently um, fined by the US Department of Transportation for this very exact thing. People aren't binary about their skill in operating websites either. Uh, here's a graph with two axes arranged in a cross shape the x-axis is uh, the x-axes are labeled completely unfamiliar and expert, and the y-axis um, are labeled fully able and severely impaired. When I'm healthy and working on my personal laptop, I can use Google Docs with ease. But I'm not that smart, so I'm going to have some difficulty learning about differential calculus on Khan Academy. Maybe I'm traveling in a foreign country and need to get some kind of critical information but I don't speak the language, have a limited data plan, and I'm jet lagged and sick from the long flight. Or maybe I'll just get old. Another way to put this, I tab through forums all the time. Am I an assistive technology user? Really, it's not about what a system identifies me as. It's about how well a system responds to who I am and what I experience when I use it. Because of this, what I'm asking you to do is embrace the unknown. On the slide is a picture of Hank Hill being embraced by John Redcorn. Hank is a very uh, Hank has a very uncomfortable expression on his face. Uh, King of the Hill is a fantastic show, by the way. I highly recommend watching it. Um, focus styles are so baked into what the web is that we don't even consider it a, a unique standalone feature. If you're going to make a browser for mass consumption, it's just simply part of the table stakes. Uh, here's a screenshot from Can I Use, where I'm searching for focus. And it basically just lists CSS 2.1 selectors. Uh, it doesn't even try to break them apart to make that distinction. Everything is supported. It's green, green across the board. We're not always using the latest device or the latest version of a browser either. Uh, this is a $30 smartphone from Walmart. And if you're economically disadvantaged, unhoused, or live in an emerging market, you simply may not have access to a device capable of taking advantage of the latest technology. Uh, the Geo smartphone is a lower power device that is incredibly popular in Indi India right now. It does have a web browser. In fact, some people purchase and use devices that are no longer supported specifically because of the fact that it makes it affordable. Uh, this is the now defunct Windows phone. Um, these groups of users represent millions of people, many of whom have never used the internet before. Should we turn our backs on them because of this? Browsers are eating the world. We're going to keep finding them in places we never thought they'd be. Uh, here is developer Drew McLean discovering that his new car has a browser built into it and apps. So in closing, um, it's important to keep the following in mind. Good user experiences meet the user where they are, not where we hope they'll be. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you to Thomas, Stacy, and Accessibility New York City for this wonderful opportunity. Um, this deck is available on notice if you're interested, including some references. And if you have any questions or feedback, um, my website is also listed here as well, ericwbailey.design. Um, and I'm Eric W. Bailey on most social media. Please harass me. Um, and also be hanging around if you want to ask some questions, or we can jump right into questions now. Thanks.
There we go. I haven't thought about the best way of phrasing this question, preface, but um, do you have any advice or thoughts on how to balance um, fully able focus styles or any kind of decoration with um, maybe the kinds of much more differentiated styles you might need to have it be recognized by somebody who isn't um, and how to, how to balance the two or whether maybe fully abled people don't need, don't mind if it's much more apparent, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Um, the, the tack I take is don't make a big deal about it. Um, so, you know, hooking your hover state in with your focus state, uh, as long as that's apparent and distinct, I think that's, you know, that's okay. Um, I, I start to get a little uncomfortable when you start making a distinction between, um, you know, ability and, you know, lack of ability, because that starts to get into, like, what is a disability, you know, if I might need it if I get my pupils dilated and I'm having a real hard time seeing or if I break my arms and that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of like preserving the overall aesthetics, uh, you know, I think if you're taking the time to work on a, you know, like a, on a mature design system, these are the kinds of conversations you should be having. Um, if you are have an inherited one or you don't have one, I think it's one of those things I like to kind of sneak in. Um, it's amazing what people don't notice if you don't tell them. And this is one of those things that I think is like where you're being kind of a white hat designer or developer um, and just kind of getting something in there for the people that rely on it. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry if I... Yeah, and uh, I would love to talk a little bit more after anyway. Yeah, yeah, for but sure. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? My question is quick on... Hang on, uh, here I come. Sorry, my question is quick, uh, maybe two parts, on just some of the best practices around states. So you mentioned like a visited state. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of alluded that it was maybe more of a privacy issue than accessibility issue, but you know, what is best practice for visited state? Should it be different color? Should it be the same? Uh, and then also, any, re uh, any recommendations whether a hover state and a focus state can or should be the same? Um, sometimes in design, to me, they seem like they, they should be the same. I didn't know if there was a reason to distinguish a focus state versus a hover state. Yeah, um, so to for the first part, the reason that uh, visited links are restricted and what you can do with them is because some very clever, evil pe people figured out that you can use it for uh, fingerprinting uh, your browser, which then in turn can be used to de-anonymize you and yada, 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 and all the bad stuff that comes with that. Um, in terms of the UX of styling a visited link, uh, you kind of run into an interesting kind of chicken and egg problem here where not a lot of people do it. So when you see it, sometimes people, especially if you're lower, tech, lower on the technologically literate to kind of scale, may not know what's happening and why it's changed. Um, because of this, I think it's really important to user test this kind of stuff um, with your intended audience. So if they can kind of, if they can grok wire including a visited link state and like it reads as uh, yes i visited this this is something i've done kind of like the check mark thing for that just because it communicates like i've checked this off my list of the stuff to do um the other kind of thing with the visited link state is like it's it's a contextual thing so like n not everything like your primary nav you know you don't really need to know if you visited or it or not because you may be returning there this is more kind of for like a Ah uh, yes, I've seen this. I acknowledge that I've seen this. If I come back to it, and I, you know, there's a list of 50 links. Okay, I did go to this one. Great, cool. Does that answer the first part? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then the second part, um, I personally, if you're going to really practice what you preach, um, they are distinct and discrete states for a reason. So I think it is good to communicate that. You know, you might have a multimodal user input. So somebody who's navigating with a mouse, but is tabbing um, and kind of switching on the fly. So you want to basically kind of communicate that like, yes, cursor is over here, but this has focus. Um, if that makes sense. Mm. Just to kind of like very concretely state what 
action has transpired and like what's going to happen uh, because of that action. Okay. So, so you're essentially saying you recommend them having different states, different ideally, styling, different ideally, styling, yes. excuse me. Yeah. If okay. not, hook it into a hover. I'll be happy. This is, uh, I guess, on like a thought of getting a consistent uh, visual focus state. But when you have, you know, a, a page that actually has a dark theme, maybe in the header, and then a lighter theme in the bottom, do you have thoughts or designs that you think, you know, maintain a consistency when when they, you want like a strong contrast on the rectangle on the background changes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's fine to make, you know, uh, foc you know, bespoke focus styles for each of your components. So long as like the overall effect is like, ah, yes, this has been focused to. So like if you're just shifting the color around to, you know, reflect what it's been placed on top of, I think that's fine. Um, you know, again, like it's, it's such a underutilized thing in CSS that I'm just happy to see it at all usually. Um, so like things like links, if you're shifting the underlines away on the body copy, I'll take it. Um, you know, if, if your primary nav and your footer has a slightly different treatment, like maybe a outline ring, that's cool. Um, just more, it's more consistency within the kind of component that you're navigating through. So like if you have five links and a footer, and it, one changes color, one underlines, one outlines, so you like the, what's going on here? What did I, what, what? <laughs> so that's the kind of thing like when I'm saying like consistency within the component, I'm kind of getting that. Thanks. Yeah. Microphone's coming. Hi, Eric. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Uh, question for you. Um, can you give a use case where your business says, I, don't per I per do not want uh, focus styles? I think they're annoying and irritating, and, and the default browser ones make me want to punch people. Um, how would I, as a developer or a QA engineer, in your opinion, what what is that conversation like to help people do the correct thing um, and move that forward? Yeah. Um, oof. <laughs> so I mean, you you can you can be the good cop. You can show um, usability studies, um, if especially if you can kind of tie that into the business's primary focus. Uh, if you can show somebody abandoning a shopping cart, say, because they're unable to operate it with a keyboard, that very kind of, in my mind, that very distinctly says, oh, we're leaving money on the table. And then if you want to swing it into bad cop territory, and you are a business, and you are selling things on the internet, and somebody can't complete it because they can't focus to it, there's a, there's a lot of law out there that is says this is not something that you can do because it violates civil rights. That probably won't make you a lot of friends, but um, you know I'm not in this business to make friends. I'm in this business to make good design. Uh, that's a very easy thing to say up here, but I know in the trenches it's a lot different. And I do think that's why Focus Visible kind of was implemented. And uh, I don't know. It's like kind of born of that space, and also like the weird like oh I don't like that. That's ugly, which is kind of the point of this talk. Which is like we need to kind of talk about recontextualizing them and demonstrating their utility. Hi, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been watching Focus Visible for probably like since life got busy in November. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing anything upriver in Chrome? Like Chrome Canaries? <sighs> yeah, I think it's under a feature flag right now. Yeah. Um, uh, the polyfill works. Uh, like to dig into the technical details of it, like the description of what a focus event is is kind of like Ooh. so i'm very skeptical of that detection um, another thing i've had some conversations with people about kind of focus visible flickering on and off um, as it's detecting whether or not you're you know you're switching input and it's pr like you know anecdotal but it's been um described as very confusing, uh, especially for uh, users that are using a magnifying screen, because basically that consistency is now thrown away and you don't know why did it blink blue this way this one time and not this way this, this other time, did I, did I break something, that kind of thing. On its way. 
Sorry, I was just going to add that I think to your question before is that before you implement any code or any code changes or like frameworks that unless you have like a culture of accessibility and you actually say that's important for your company, then it's never going to happen, right? Because it's, it is extra work. So just to your point, like just the easy answer is like, no, like accessibility is important to us and that's why we're doing this. So I think that like that was a lesson that we learned that we're like, oh yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be compliant. And like, there's not much empathy in saying I want to be compliant. Whereas we're like, hey, actually accessibility is really important to us and this is the right thing. Then all of a sudden, all my developers, all the engineers were like, oh, okay, now I get why we have to go spend extra effort on like designing for this or implementing this. So yeah. I think that, that was like a really important lesson that, that we learned. And I'm sure you're already doing that because you're here. Um, <laughs> but I think that like before you get into the code, like making sure you have the empathy and the, the reason before it is definitely uh, really important. Yeah. I'm actually just curious, like Bootstrap is obviously a CSS framework. There, are there any other like CSS frameworks that actually you'd recommend as a base when it comes to a lot of these things? I mean, you mentioned browser having a focus visit, like a focus state, but like, are there any CSS frameworks that you've seen? Um, I have complicated issues with CSS frameworks. Yeah. That all being said, I believe Bootstrap does include a focus indicator now. I believe Foundation does as well, but it also has <coughs> other accessibility usability problems so I haven't checked in on it for a while, but I was kind of waiting for it to do a little growing up. Um, I can post on the Meetup page. I can do a quick little audit of some other, you know, the popular stuff out there and give some recommendations if you'd like. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. <clears throat> um, I had kind of a follow-up question related to that, which is, do you have examples of sites or web apps that you could bring up that have a really good demonstration of focus styles. So not just, you know, compliant and visible and that sort of thing, but also beautiful and integrated into the overall design system. You know, I should have a list. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Google Hangouts, I don't know if the current redesign, um, they actually have one where the focus ring is animated and it shifts position visually to the next focusable element. That's really cool, it's a little animation um, and it really kind of helps communicate that like, oh, I was here, but now I'm here. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Gov.uk, which I'm a fanboy of, has really good focus styles. Um, if you look a lot of like, yay, you know, open standards, web developer -y people, usually they have some pretty good ones because they're, you know, they work in the space. Um, I think 18F maybe also. Mm. Possibly, I, I can get a list, but yeah, um, I'm always happy when I see them. Awesome. Oh, CSS Tricks actually just redesigned, and uh, now when you hover or focus, or when you focus, you get this cool gradient overlay on your links, and it's this nice little surprise. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, here we go. This is kind of a comment and question. Curious if you've seen. Uh, basically the access key or uh, accelerator key of like desktop software in the past, like having the visualization of like this letter is underlined, it'll move focus, you know, it'll actually jump me to this area of the page. That seems like that really went away in the web yeah. design world. And I was curious, I mean, have you seen designs on that? Do you think that's a potentially good idea or like visualizing how do you move focus, not just sequentially, but yeah, so like using access keys to kind of hop around the page. And yeah. yeah. Um, as a nerd, I love that idea because moving the mouse is effort. And, ugh, who has time for that? Um, I know there's a, there's actually, I was just talking with a ThoughtBot employee. There's a Chrome extension that is like a Vim, but for the web. And, you know, in that stop, stop trying to define these things in concrete terms, he's a perfectly able-bodied user that was also complaining about the fact that, like, if you don't use an interact, you know, an interactive element, his Vim mode can't actually let him navigate the website. And I was like, "Huh, yeah, interesting. Wow, weird." Um, so, like, the thing about access keys that are like kind of bother me is the lack of the um, the lack of external consistency. So, like. Twitter has keyboard shortcuts, but those don't translate to another website. And that gets into a weird thing where you basically have to relearn 
an interface for every set on the web. Um, there's also accidental activation. Um, I've definitely like started to type a tweet and then like the JavaScript caught up with my clicking and I accidentally sent one that was half completed and then I feel bad and delete it. Um, I think that's something that like I think is a missed opportunity for browsers. I'd love to uh, have like jumping to headings, jumping to landmarks would be great. Um, there's browser extensions that do that, and I actually use them all the time because, again, you know, scrolling is so much work, and I'd rather just jump around. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like especially, you know, it'd be great if you could link to every heading declared on every website without an ID attribute. That'd be great. Like a lot of CMSs have started to do that, and I'm all for it. <laughs> Deep linking, yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry. So first of all, thank you so much for all this and the presentation was incredibly well done. Um, one more question we had recently in the design was, uh, in regards to focus states is when you have tiles, sometimes you have a tile mm -hmm. and then within the tile or like the square, um, you have a text link, maybe it says read more, mm -hmm. um, or like check out this. Um, do you find from a focus state you should focus the entire tile when it's selected or just focus the link state? Is the entire tile navigable? Yes. Okay. Um, is is it a link buried inside of a link? Well, essentially, the it's one big link, and then okay. the yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I'd wrap it to the tile. If the entire area is something that's a hit target, you're basically identifying it as a hit target. Um, you know, counter that with like if it's too big to be recognizable as interactive. Yeah, that was that the could, problem. Yeah. Like it wasn't extensible because. Someone's using a bigger screen, maybe the tile's bigger, and it's not clear that the tile actually links to read more. Yeah. And another problem we ran into was in some of the tiles we have like read more or like skip the page or mm -hmm. and we had actually multiple links within yeah. the tile. So in that use case, it didn't work to have the tile because you'd have to have the, the yeah. links. This sounds like a perfect opportunity for focus within. Focus within. Oh, okay. Ah, yeah. So you can have your cake and eat it too. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's exactly what we're doing. Awesome. Shiny new Thank toys. You. All right. It's paid for admission. Thank you. <laughs> great. Uh, any other questions for tonight? Uh, we'll be around hanging out. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. Um, any announcements or anything? Sam, I think yes. you have one. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. Uh, I work as an accessibility consultant, uh, but why I'm in front of you today is because I lead a project called uh, Your Everyday Ally in partnership with the Global Shapers Community, which is an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Uh, my team and I believe that with tech ed education, we can empower people with disabilities to lead more independent, confident, and empowered lives. About one-fifth of adults in the U.S. live with some form of disability, and I'm one of them. Living with, living with cerebral palsy and working as an accessibility consultant, I know firsthand the transformative power that technology can have on people like me. When I got my first smartphone, it opened an entirely new world for me, uh, making me feel much more comfortable and confident traveling independently across the U.S., but especially in New York City. Uh, with Your Everyday Ally, we want, to build, we want to broaden access to tech education for people with disabilities through one-day workshops to teach, to teach people with disabilities how to leverage the tools within their smartphones, such as navigation, mobile banking, time, and task management applications. We spent the last few months, we spent the last few months validating our idea, interviewing subject matter experts, and conducting market research. We're currently building the workshop curriculum. Uh, if you're someone you know, have experience in education, curriculum building, occupational therapy, assistive technology, or any other, anything else that might be relevant, uh, we'd love to get your in input. Please come find me uh, after this. And just thank you.
Um, and as an aside, I wanted to introduce Tanya, who's going to be helping us out with social media interactions, uh, that sort of thing. So if you have events outside of, uh, you know, tonight and the hour that we have here, um, she's great to reach out to. We'll be sharing different things going on in the community. Hi, my name is Tanya Davies, and um, I volunteer to help, and I'm doing social media. So feel free, of course, to reach out. And also, I will be posting a lot of interesting things as well that relate to Align NYC. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, we can hang out here for a bit, but uh, Huge thank you to ThoughtBot for providing the space, uh, to Jolly with the Internet Society of New York for handling streaming and recording and all that good stuff, and for Mirror by Night with white coat captioning, and Level Access for their ongoing sponsorship. And thank you all for coming. And yeah, we'll hang out for a bit and then, yes? Sorry, one more announcement. One more announcement, sorry. I'm going to come to these things. Um, so uh, I work at a company called Seamless Docs. We do. Uh, web forms and PDF forms, uh, bringing them all online for government. Uh, we have a big initiative this year on making all of our forms and our PDF forms all accessible. Um, with that being said, we're also looking to hire a director or VP or a chief accessibility officer. Um, we work with just a, I think over 500 governments, right, ranging from state governments to local governments, and the goal is to not all of them have those resources, so be able to provide, be a resource for them around accessibility and more specifically for us, digital accessibility. So if you know someone, uh, we're, we're looking to, to hire a full-time role um, to both help with education content, but also these types of things as well. So thank you. Cool. Um, I would also recommend posting that uh, in the forum on Meetup and reach, and if you haven't already, reaching out to uh, A11Y Jobs on Twitter. Uh, they tend to repost um, awesome opportunities like that. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, everybody.